It's a pleasure speaking to you, and I know you want to give us your thoughts in particular around the payments, the evolution of the payment space. And I think you've got one or two slides as well that you want to use. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your invitation and good morning all of you, even from far away. Um, maybe we could see the first slide. It, it's, it's not very complicated or um, move to the second, please. Yes, it's, it's just to show that um, with innovation, the, 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 the ecosystem of payments is uh, becoming more complex, but it means also that the offer for the consumers, for all of us, is also broader. Um, we have new uh, forms of commerce with e-commerce. I don't need to insist on that above all in a time of uh, confinement. Uh, it, uh, this is one of the elements of the society as it works now. We, we should not underestimate as well the remittances, so the money sent uh, to uh, countries in the south uh, where cross-border payments play a big role and where part of the informal uh, development aid is, is, is taking place. So we have several new elements. Uh, first of all, uh, we have the possibility to pay to each other P2P, uh, which was not the case in the past. We have the, the big techs entering the, the system uh, because they have lots of uh, clients or people connected and lots of data and it gives them the opportunity to enter the market. So in the past we had the banks and, 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 the, and the distribution, but now we have several actors and we can hope through innovation to improve customer experience with instant payments, uh, automated payments, uh, reduction of the costs, etc. So I think we should first of all underline how much how positive the uh, evolution of this sector may be. Uh, and uh, I remember in France, we still have people paying with check, which is something uh, unbelievable today, but um, the move is accelerating and it's a really a, a vibrant innovation ecosystem. Of course, the more you innovate and introduce um, uh, new techniques, the more the fraud techniques uh, are getting more sophisticated as well. So these all, uh, system includes specifically the fintechs. Uh, in the payment sectors, we have several unicorns worldwide, such as Stripe in the US, TransferWise in the UK, Klarna, Klarna in, in Sweden, N26, etc. And their success comes from their ability to focus on specific services or uh, introducing a missing link in the payment chain and uh, they oblige us to rethink the way we conceived banking and, and payment. And of course, as I mentioned before, we have the big tech with their huge amount of clients and potential knowledge of uh, the, the clients. Uh, uh, the most famous um, project being the Libra DM1, but uh, there may be other ones in the, in the future. And they have devoted the, the, the incumbents. It's important to think that we still have the old system, if I may say so, uh, try to diversify their own offer. It's true in France, for example, for Societe Générale, but also you have Amex doing many things and Crédit Agricole. I don't want to quote too many of them. A very interesting thing uh, in this context is that the pandemic has hastened, hastened the pace of, of digitalization. Uh, according to a recent Eurosystem study, and this is interesting for the, from a central bank perspective, 40% uh, of the respondents indicated using less cash um, due to concern about the risk of contamination. Uh, but also as digital payments are made more convenient, we can even use it at the bakery for very small amounts. Um, this trend was also visible in France, where contactless initiation was used for 50% of point of sale card payments at the end of last year, compared to 30% in 2019. And this kind of jump uh, uh, is, is really linked with, uh, with the pandemics. Uh, the corona crisis also benefited mobile payment solutions, even if in France um, the, the use of card is still um, more frequent. But for example, the, the, the traditional banks have uh, created Paylib, which is a kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer interpayment pay, 
payment solution based on credit transfer. And that was used, for example, for small professionals who were not equipped at the beginning of the lockdown. So this is an, an, a fantastic, uh, complex new ecosystem that does oblige, and I insist, the central banks to enter new territories. So how should we position ourselves? It's the following slides. Uh, just a, a, an image of, we try to find an equilibrium. It's, it's quite difficult, but we, we will do our best to, to reach it. First of all, we, we really want to encourage and promote innovation and competition for the ultimate benefit of payment users and for a more performing uh, financial system. There is no doubt. Uh, there are undisputed benefits for users. I've quoted already some of them, the lower prices, a better quality of services, the readiness to be uh, to adapt as we have experienced last year uh, in real life. Um, the technological progress carries out also the potential to improve the performance of market infrastructures uh, with a better tracking of transaction, ownership, cost efficiency, speed and availability around the clock for, for cross-border payments in the globalized economy. So central banks uh, tool to stimulate innovation are well known. It's the adaptation of legislation to accompany new trends and trigger innovation. We were involved in the PSD2 directive in the implementation and everything that has to do with open banking. I remember when I was in the European Parliament years ago, the concept was already, was at that time considered very strange. Uh, and we are, I will come back to that, we, we are experimenting directly enter the, the, the system as operators. It's all the work we are beginning to do on um, central bank digital currencies. And we also encourage virtuous private initiatives, so, such as EPI, uh, which would provide uh, a card for uh, Europe, cards and other uh, ways of payments. Uh, cross-border in, in the whole Europe and giving us also the control of the data. When I say us, the Europeans, it's a private initiative, but it's a consortium of, of, of banks and, and, uh, and the providers that could uh, bring a new, uh, new means of, of payment. And of course, we have many experiences. We have at the Banque de France a, a lab for some uh, experiences with uh, with private banks, with the BIS Innovation Hub, with uh, the Paul Field Tech of the SEPR. But of course, and this is the other side of the balance we try to, to, to maintain, we all know that the more you digitalize, the more you are sensitive to cyber risks. This is the first point. The second one is that, of course, we don't want in any case that all the regulations against uh, money laundering or aiming at controlling uh, terrorist financing could be undermined. So we have to make sure that we keep the good side of innovation, but we control uh, the possible uh, gray zones, which is not always easy, uh, of course. Um, and of course, in the loopholes, you can always have hacking attacks. We have observed in France an increase in, in, in hacking during, during the, the pandemics and above all the first lockdown. Um, we have to have a dialogue with, uh, with the big techs uh, because of, of their own projects and the rules we have adopted in Europe, uh, GDPR on privacy, because it's also an issue for, for the European citizens. And uh, we are proud that our rules are now using worldwide um, as at least, I would not say a model, but as a reference helping to create other uh, data protection systems uh, everywhere in the world, such so as California, for example. And of course, um, we have um, we have um, we have observed that the Commission is doing a lot of work with uh, the digital finance package, uh, in particular the proposed uh, markets in crypto assets regulation, uh, and it will be key. And we did a lot uh, during the French presidency of the G7 in 2019, and it's one of the key topics that is at the agenda. Okay, so and I was moving for a small remark on, on cash, because cash, it's very interesting that we discuss a lot innovation, but just to give you the, the, the figures, 
the majority of uh, point of safe transactions still occur in cash. Uh, in France, is uh, only yes the use of cash. No, it's just to say that as central bankers, we try to offer the freedom of choice. It's very important. It's enshrined in the law that people can continue to pay uh, with cash if they want. So we have to make sure that all new uh, means of payments are safe and uh, and available for the majority of people. I just wanted to underline that, of course, uh, we, um, we 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 make everything for 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 the the, the, the consumers to uh, to use it to use cash as as legal tenders. Also, with certain conditions uh, for tax reason, um, uh, or it's no more than three hundred euro, for example. Um, in the meantime, we so I began with the new revolution of uh, new payment, but we try to keep the offer of cash. And France has a quite a large territory compared to other member states of the European Union, where when you have to make sure that you have money in, in all the DAB, uh, it's uh, quite costly. Uh, the banks are providing this, but we recycle the money. We have not forgotten the fact that uh, we need also to um, increase, as I've said, and, and, and safeguard the possibility for the ones who want to use, uh, to use cards or uh, mobile payments uh, with the use of the traditional banking account. And of course, then I move to the last point, which is the, the question of uh, should central bank enter directly uh, these, uh, this market and provide wholesale or retail uh, CBDC? Um, you all know that the European Central Bank and the Council of Governors, the, the Governing Council in October decided to launch uh, a study. So we take it very seriously, even, if, even as blockchain and DLT technologies have not yet unlocked completely their potential. We already foresee that they are heading towards the financial sector, making increasing use of uh, tokenized financial assets with a view of um, to generating efficiency gains. So we don't want to stay outside, but I'm, I want to give you a, a message, which is we, we have a lot to study and to work on uh, and to understand in which form we could issue and distribute one day central bank money. Uh, should it be wholesale for large payments? Should it be retail? Uh, in any case, how can we make sure that it remains safe and, and liquid? There is an element of uh, international influence of the Euro as well. You know that countries like China have already developed some um, experiences and at, at large scales. So we don't want to be out of this wave of innovation, but we, uh, we have started experimenting and we should be very modest in uh, experimenting because we don't know exactly what the result is going to be. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a, how can I say, it's a field where sometimes changes are very rapid, as I've said before. So we don't exclude anything, but we are in this space. And we will have, of course, to see how we can uh, first and, uh, use it as a wholesale central bank digital currency in interbank settlements. Um, the euro system is at work on that, and we will uh, decide eventually uh, how to proceed and uh, how we do it with a kind of do not arm um, uh, approach which is to, and this is the last slide, just to, to give you the whole picture we have in mind. Uh, we have costs and our mission is to guarantee public access to the cash and we will continue. We accompany the transformation of the non-cash payment sector. Here you have two people shaking hands, which is something we have not experienced uh, in the last months. But the idea is that there are already existing way to connect people. And of course, we are building up our capacity to respond, uh, to, respond to, uh, to the challenges that are now already launched. Once again, on this point, I insist on, 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 on one element, which is that we are not alone uh, worldwide dealing with all these issues. And we will have to make sure that the Euro is, uh, has the role it deserves. Uh, worldwide in a world that is very much changing. But I mean, there will be 
other conferences in the future to discuss again where we will be uh, soon. And I'm very happy to uh, take some of your questions if you, if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvie, for this very clear, uh, you know, vision and, and setting out of the issues, as we always know from you. I note down loads of questions and I see kind of how many we can get to. And obviously, please, to the audience, again, I know I uh, didn't mention it, but as per usual, our Q&A function is open and please do feel free to just at any time throw in some questions. I think I found really interesting, Sylvia, as you say, that the different types of function, modes of payments um, still exist and that actually the use of cash across the EU has gone up rather than down. Now, I don't quite know how the uh, COVID crisis impacted that, but overall cash payments have also still increased. And it's more about the choice and mixture of different means of payments depending on the customer's preferences or the circumstances. And I find that just fascinating in the payment space. But coming to the first question, you started with the international dimension and working in the international dimension. How do you see that work that's going on by the FSB and CPMI that was initiated by the Saudi Arabia G20 chairmanship on global remittances and just increasing efficiency, not just in the EU, but globally, and, and also dealing with the, uh, what do I call it, the banking, uh, correspondence banking relationships? Well, it's, it's right. I've, I've not mentioned that uh, enough. It's, it's um, well, the work done by the CPMI under the chairmanship of, of John Cunliffe has uh, made uh, progresses. We consider this is an excellent example on how specific, how concrete it can be. It seems to be an issue uh, for, for meetings at, at the G20, but I remember when I arrived in Riyadh for the only meeting that took place physically last year in February, I've seen these uh, crowds of people arriving in, 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 in Riyadh uh, from, uh, I don't know, the Philippines or Bangladesh. Or so, and we know in our countries, we also have lots of people working very hard and sending money to, uh, to their uh, countries of origin. So we consider that we have to do everything to help these cross-border payments to be safe. And, and remember that as far as Europe is concerned, the amount of money transferred by private persons is larger than the aid we give to development to Africa. So it is something that is not minor. It's not a minor issue. On where we are going to go, I, I, at this stage, I cannot say what the result will be, but I know that for the, the, G, uh, the Italian G20 presidency, it is at the top of, of the agenda. And, and against that backdrop, we, we, uh, you, know, you mentioned the European Payments Initiative, some of the, uh, the promotion of instant payments within Europe, so, so you're working towards some of its own solutions, alternatives to some of the existing international payment schemes that we see. How, how, what is driving that uh, discussion or debate? Is it linked to the broader strategic autonomy theme that we've heard a lot about over the last few days? Do you think it's essential or necessary for Europe to develop its own payment solutions? To, to kind of create some, some level of independence or, or capability to act independently? Yes, um, first of all, it's a private initiative. So it's not something driven by central banks or governments. So I suppose that you will also listen to some of the bankers and, and providers involved in the, in the project. From the central bank perspective, everything that strengthened the capacity of the European to be independent from any kind of uh, changes worldwide uh, in the rules of use of data uh, or in the, uh, in the way transfers are, are organized uh, is not bad. You know that Ursula von der Leyen insisted on the geopolitical commission. I think it's not against anyone. It's just the, the willingness to, to have the, 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 the capacity to control some uh, flux of payment, but we are in a, in a market economy. So, and, and I hope we, we stay in a market economy, which is free. So as you uh, rightly stressed, the idea is to have another offer and to make them compete with the existing ones. And uh, 
maybe we, we discussed uh, uh, so just before the beginning of, of the, the um, of, of this presentation, I have the feeling as well that some years ago there was a kind of uh, um, aggressive vision of what new initiatives could be, be it from the old world, be it from the new world. Be it from... Now people are realizing that uh, the young generations are changing their habits, that maybe they, they need a larger variety of, of offers. And uh, so that's the reason why, of course, we observe what uh, the, the private actors are doing. We support, we took even a joint position with Burkhard Bals from the Bundesbank uh, in June in the press. Uh, and we hope above all that the, the scope will be enlarged, that it will become a real pan-European uh, payment solution, including the countries that were not there at the beginning. And that the deepening, you know, it's the whole story of the European integration. You, you need to enlarge and deepen at the same time, which is not always easy. And they are in an intermediary phase. But we hope that in the spring or sometimes during this year, they will uh, manage to create a, a structure with more members once again and, um, and begin to, to offer after they, they are in the governance building phase, but uh, the, the, the goal is to have a business case and to, to begin business as soon as possible. And, and I'm happy you, you mentioned your initiative with Burkhardt because I was about to ask you about that. <laughs> what, where we tried to get Burkhardt, but we had Joachim here yesterday. I can't have both of them in, in the same conference. So we rotate between them, so to speak. But, uh, the, I mean, one of the things I read into your op-ed or article was that actually if we get very efficient payment services in Europe, you know, it reduces the need for some of these initiatives like the Digital Euro or a DM initiative. And I just want to explore a little bit more about that. Do you, how do you think these kind of crypto initiatives fit into this? Is it kind of something that, that might replace payments or do you think that if the EPI or other initiatives take off they kind of make this new debate around crypto assets redundant in the payment space? Where do you see that interconnection between those two developments in the payment space? Now first of all I appreciate that you use the word crypto asset because sometimes people talk about money and I think we are different things. Uh, my, my last slide and, and all my speech was based on the idea that there is room for offers of very different natures. And it's not uh, an alternative where you have to choose either you do this or you do that. Um, once again, from the point of view of central banks, the important element and our mission is to make sure that whatever uh, the proposal coming from the business is it is safe for the consumers, it is consumer friendly, it does reduce the cost, it, it makes it, it has a purpose for the society, but it's not up to us to choose. First of all, I confess, we don't know what is going to happen. And maybe I was not clear on cash. What I wanted to say is there is not an increase in cash, there is a decrease in use of cash in 2019, at least in France, but even in the Eurozone, um, there is a decrease. But the interesting element is that we observe a decrease, an increase in, um, in uh, contactless payments. This is obvious. But at the same time, the demand of notes is increasing. Maybe because interest rates are very low, people keep money at home. In French, we say sous le matelas in, in their bed. I don't know where they put it, but actually we observe a form of leakage or increase of the, the number of banknotes circulating or not circulating actually, but being kept. Maybe it has also to do with the fact that the Euro is becoming uh, more and more um, a currency outside the Eurozone and as a reserve currency in the Balkans or in Africa or in the Mediterranean, many people have euros uh, as, as, uh, as savings. So this is the reason why it's very complicated to answer your question, because of course we are talking about payments, but a currency has several functions and you have people who can um, use 
uh, contactless payments or uh, digital uh, modern uh, tools. And at the same time, they can wish to keep cash. And um, it's not up to us to, to dictate what the behavior should be. We have just to make sure that all, all means of payments and, and our banknotes and that the whole system is stable and, and safe. Thank you, Sylvie. Maybe one last question to finish us off. You, you talked about data and the importance of data also in the context of the EPI and other initiatives. You said to keep the data in Europe, use the data in Europe. And you also referred to open banking being introduced through the PSD for the first time. And, uh, you know, Gabriel Bernardino talked about the paper on open insurance. And we heard about open finance being broader. What role do you see for data and how do you see this whole idea of open banking or open finance evolving? Because to a certain extent, it disintermediates bet between the relationship of the customer and the bank. So introduce potentially a new player into the whole banking system and the monetary policy transmission mechanism. Well, it's a, it's a large issue for the last minutes we have, but you're perfectly right that we observe changes in the intermediation and it is due to a certain part to the legislator. We were not the ones in the central bank wishing or not wishing. We, we take the legislation as it is, but of course uh, the, 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 the European Commission is aware that uh, the more you introduce uh, actors in, 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 the, in the chain, the, the more who is honing data becomes a central issue. Um, data is absolutely key. Uh, we observe it in, in, in e-commerce with the platforms. We observe it with uh, the, the potential uh, development of, uh, of DM. We know uh, in the central banks how important it is for us to look at data to see the transmission of monetary policy. But I suggest that we do not enter right now the question of the transmission of monetary policy because it will be too complicated if you don't mind. It will be for next year. <laughs> I, I understand, and there was, uh, there's only so much we can cover in any one uh, conference or meeting. And as you said, there will be more conferences, and uh, there will be another one of our conferences. And yes, I didn't want to get into the monetary policy debate around crypto assets. <laughs> it, it, it's, it was a real pleasure having you with us uh, this morning, Sylvie. I always say that after each session, I hope we can see you in person soon again, that we can all kind yeah. of uh, meet and shake hands, as you said in, in your last slide something that we're all not used to anymore, which is quite sad. It's really nice to have had you with us and Thank that technology you. allowed this. Thanks, Sylvie. Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye. All the best.